Welcome to Technado with Don Pizet, featuring Sys Admin Expert Don Pizet, Security Specialist Daniel Lowry, and Peter. All right, welcome to Technado with Don Pizet. I'm your host Peter Van Rysdam, and joined as always by Don Pizet. Don, how are you doing today? I am doing great. You know, still still waiting for that episode where we get to announce the end of the pandemic, but that is not this episode. <laughs> yeah, I have that news article ready to go. I'm just waiting to press send on the blog. It's like, like when you pre-write somebody's obituary, you're just holding on to it, like Daniel's. <laughs> yep. There's a, there's a light at the end of the tunnel. There's though. like a, there's a stack of like fake obituaries, to, or, or ready-made, should I say, yeah. obituaries, because God knows how I'm going out. <laughs> <laughs> oh, a jet ski accident. It, <laughs> It's and, the, uh, the the Saturday Night Live. Yeah, they did that with Tom Brokaw. Uh, yeah, Tom Brokaw. Yeah. You don't want Stone Phillips representing this information. <laughs> <to you. laughs> and Daniel, you are doing well, it sounds uh, like. I'm doing well. I had a lot of fun this weekend. I uh, I set up a pie hole, and that was that was interesting. I had to hack my home router to do it because they wouldn't let me change DNS settings because I rented uh, from the thing. And I was like, oh, no, I can get around this garbage. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that confused me for a while because where I'm from, your pie hole's your mouth. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so a pie hole is a uh, DNS sinkhole device so I can take ad and tracking traffic and just push it off into nowhere and then just have legitimate traffic. So I'm you know, more, more internet privacy focused uh, here lately. I'm playing around with some stuff and having a good time with it. Mm, well, that sounds fun. And we are joined today uh, by our guest, Mark Hedgley, who is the CTO at NNT, which is New Net Technologies. Mark, how are you doing? Yeah. Hi, guys. Yeah. Uh, pleased to be here. Thanks for inviting me. Is there is there a light at the end of the tunnel for the pandemic over there? Um, did, no, is... not at all. No, we. Uh, <laughs> it's just hard it, uh, it, it briefly, we briefly saw it in the distance, and then it's been extinguished, and uh, it's uh, it's gone. So uh, no, we're we're worse off than any other country in the world. I think I know everybody thinks that, but uh, yeah. Yeah, America's got like, vaccines. vaccines. America's like, hold my beer. We're coming. Yeah, we, yeah, we like to be best yeah. at things. <laughs> <laughs> we'll show you. Yeah, even even terrible, <laughs> terrible things. But yeah, well, yeah, you guys made one of the vaccines at Oxford, so yeah, I mean, they should they should have kept a couple around. They're taking and uh, they are taking the credit, but yeah, no, it's um, they, they, they are at least uh, getting my my folks who are in their eighties. They got vaccinated uh, over okay. the weekend, so it's it's real. It's coming. Yeah. Yeah, I think I'm gonna like dye my hair like super gray and see if I can go go get some vaccines. <laughs> I don't think. That well, I heard one of the uh, one of the guys who works for us. He's in uh, he's in Florida, and they're running it as a, a lottery. So if you're feeling lucky, you can uh, <laughs> you get your ticket, and uh, you may get the call. Yeah, there's an alligator you wrestle, and if you if you <laughs> pin it, uh, they they let you get the vaccine. So now the alligator has the vaccine inside of its mouth. <laughs> <laughs> if you can if you can get it away from the alligator, yeah, then you're good. Classic. A lot of Captain Hooks running around now. <laughs> All right, well, let's uh, let's go ahead and get to know Mark a little bit in our first segment, Rapid Fire Questions. Who do you work for? What's new? Who are you? What's happening? What's wrong with you? All right, Mark, in this segment, we're going to do Rapid Fire Questions. Each of us will take turns right. asking you a question. You will have approximately one minute to answer. If you take too long, Peter will buzz you mm. like that, and we'll move on to the next question. So it's a quick way to get to know you, and our first question is going to be coming from Peter. All right, Mark. So just to start off with a with a softball, can you tell us a little bit more about NNT, what you guys do there? Uh, yeah, we're a uh, security solutions provider. We develop uh, intelligent software to prevent cyber attacks. So there's a strong focus on vulnerability management. Uh, you know, knocking out the weak spots in uh, in any infrastructure. But the where we go way further than anybody else is in um, what we call continuous change control. And although that's recognized as a security best practice, it's one that's been done uh, pretty badly up until now. So we've sort of set out to innovate in that area. Um, it's essentially, you know, you, you know there's going to be a lot of change and distinguishing between good and bad changes, the difference between knowing whether you've been breached or not. So uh, our technology is all about helping you to identify the good from the bad. Uh, once you've isolated the bad, you're going to get a head start on you know, those zero day threats and, uh, you know, any breach that's going on. Now, I, I want to learn a little bit more about Change Tracker because I know in the old days, this stuff used to be kind of simple. You could monitor your, your user database. And if you saw a new administrator, that was a red flag, right? There's a change I need to watch out yeah. for. But now, now we have cloud and APIs and all this, you know, really complex web-based applications. What, what are the, the most significant changes that you guys monitor for? 
Yeah, well, that's uh, part of what we're trying to do. So we're covering anything from uh, cloud infrastructures right through, you know, hybrid, uh, on, on-premises on data centers. We have a lot of sort of Fortune 50 customers with with all that sort of nasty legacy stuff, you know, Solaris and uh, HPUXs, but then also sort of complete, I suppose you call them dot-com businesses, those that have got elastic containerized infrastructures, and we track it all. And we're doing, um, certainly looking for new admin accounts, but looking right down to sort of running processes, services, uh, even monitoring, you know, the integrity of the file system. So, you know, any change, any minute uh, indicator that it might be some compromise going on, uh, we're going to expose it and flag it up. The key thing, as I say, is this this ability to sort of analyze it and work out whether it was planned or unplanned, whether it's safe or, or not. Now, Mark, you obviously have quite a few products and Change Tracker being maybe even the flagship. At least that's what we're focusing on today. But there's quite a few others. Which one would you say, although we can't get into all of them, but which one's <laughs> going to be the apple of your eye? You say, oh, I'm, I'm super proud of this one. Yeah, I mean, it's like uh, asking you to name your favorite child, but um, it is really easy. is easy. <laughs> 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 um, yeah, well, if she's listening, no, that's a joke. <laughs> um, uh, no, I mean, Change Tracker is really where the most sort of innovation has happened. That's, that's the thing that's going to make us famous because, you know, it's really broken new ground. It's transformed the concept of integrity monitoring into change control. And, you know, that's translated into the most sort of commercial success too, which, um, you know, not saying we did it for the money, but, uh, you know, that's obviously nice validation in uh, in the marketplace. You know, some really big users, uh, you know, some of the world's biggest IT security service providers are using Change Tracker to underpin security of, uh, of their major customers. So, um, yeah, good good feeling, good success from uh, from Change Tracker. So looking down at your background, you've actually been at, at NNT for 12 years, which is a, a lifetime, uh, it seems like these days. People are always bouncing around. So can you tell us a little bit about uh, your experience uh, before that? Were, were you always looking to, uh, to get into the security space, or um, did, you, did you have other plans? I don't know, did you want to be a concert pianist uh, originally? <laughs> yeah, yeah I, would have, I would have loved to have been, but uh, uh, no, I don't have the fingers for it. I mean, I... Um, you know, I'm, I'm probably older than I look, obviously, but, uh, you know, I, I, I did work in a, in a factory once when I was a student a long time ago, and that was okay. But uh, next time I went back uh, to the uh, the job agency for, uh, for you know, summer, you know, vacation uh, work, the agent I spoke to said, you know, do I know anything about computers? Because if I did and I could get through the interview and convince them, then he had a, a, a gig that was paying three times as much. So, um, so I went for that. But um, you know, in the early days, it was a lot of experience of of networking, network infrastructures, then network management. And you know, during that period, I suppose, you know, around the uh, the Y two K and you know, internet boom, um, you know, it became clear that networks were getting more reliable, but also more complex. You know, there's a lot more configuration and sort of network management, up down monitoring was sort of past its day, but, um, you know, the thing that was interesting was uh, configuration and particularly the fact that networking uh, was making us all a hell of a lot uh, less secure. So um, it sort of, sort of, uh, you know, I, I sort of bled into the security market and securing things. And uh, that's why we're here. It was, you know, it's the newest and fastest growing market, the most exciting place to be. So uh, it was the uh, the natural thing to gravitate towards. And it really still is, so that's great. But uh, so last question, I, I, in looking down your LinkedIn, you mentioned that you've uh, just celebrated donating uh, blood over 100 times. <laughs> and so my, my question is, do you have any left? <laughs> not, uh, <laughs> yeah, not too much. I mean, it's actually, I mean, I want to get into I mean, it's actually uh, platelet donations. Yeah. It's, uh, it's the same kind of thing that they, you know, they stick a needle in your arm, but um, uh, while they take the blood out, they take the platelets out and then stick the, you know, the blood gets Oh, so you get the back blood in. back. So, sorry, if, yeah, if there's anyone squeamish, you does better, a better turn off right now. <laughs> so, yeah. 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 Uh, so I, I just went along to give blood and they said, uh, if, you, uh, if you've got a couple of hours to kill, then uh, we'll take your platelets because apparently I've got the most sort of universally useful platelets and... Uh, so they uh, once once they knew I had them, they wanted to get their hands on them. So I'm not saying I'm a lifesaver or hero. That's uh, 
that's for other people to say. <laughs> I don't know that I'd share that information. Now, walking <laughs> yeah. down the street, you're a target. Yeah, yeah. yeah. that guy's got the <laughs> good blood. That guy with the good blood. I'll tell you, the, the, <laughs> the yeah. pro tip is you, you give blood, and then you go to the pub, and you drink uh, much cheaper because you don't need as much. Yeah. <laughs> so, that's, uh, that's good is, planning. Yeah, they, uh, you, you know, free biscuits and uh, not free beer yet, but, uh, yeah, it's, uh, no, it's a, it's a good, good thing to do if anybody else uh, wants, to, uh, wants to give it a go. Yeah, we just get an orange juice here, so <laughs> biscuits sound nice. All right, well, let's get uh, to our next segment, which uh, is where we're going to look back. We've actually done this segment a lot recently. I feel like there's a lot of updates in news, but uh, we're going to look at something again in our Deja News segment. Deja News. All right, so Don actually found where we originally talked about this back in January 14th of uh, of 2020, uh, which was originally from TechCrunch. We talked about a billion medical images are exposed online as doctors ignore the warnings. And uh, mm. in the Deja News, it looks like doctors are still ignoring the warnings. <laughs> it's it's been a year, a so year this later. Is obviously fixed, right? Yeah, so, uh, yeah, exactly. So, from uh, healthitsecurity.com, this article is Millions of Medical Images Exposed as U.S. Fails to Secure PAX Flaws. And PAX is what the patient uh, archiving or picture archiving and communication systems. Um, so this is something that uh, that you guys actually kind of discovered, right, Mark, or, or you know, see that it's it's still going on and we're still leaking this data? Yeah, that's true. I mean, it's actually a colleague of mine, uh, Dirk Schrader, uh, who uh, got down to look at this. I mean, it's, um, you know, it's one of these classic things where, um, you know, the, the, these PAX systems, so X-ray and imaging systems, they all use uh, they're, they're they're kind of pretty crude. Um, they all use this uh, uh, DICOM um, protocol, and it's uh, you know it's known to be vulnerable. But uh, the I mean the just astonishing thing is that these PAC systems are uh, public internet accessible, and if you scan for the ports, uh, the DICOM ports, you find there's plenty of them open. And uh, what's even more mad is that there's no credentials. Even so, this isn't this isn't really hacking. This is just literally uh, walking down the street, seeing an open door that's open, wandering in, and being able to view people's medical records, test results, you know, COVID test results, and um, it's uh, it's jaw dropping. So, and particularly as you say that uh, even now it's been exposed, um, still nothing's happening. I think um, you know, comparing the original research that Dirk did to the more recent, um, some of the worst offenders have added. You know, hundreds of thousands of additional uh, images, um, all equally exposed and available. So I know if something happens, um, you know, with with PII in, in the UK, you've got GDPR, and there are there are you know uh, violation lists and and uh, and penalties put for that. And I mean, I know we have HIPAA yeah. here, uh, yeah. But are these not violations that are? I mean, I, I feel like if there's a penalty, people would stop doing it right away. But well, what's well, a few violations between friends? Come on, apparently. <laughs> One of those, I mean, it's it's a crazy thing because we, um, you know, we, it was obviously uh, disclosed to the uh, the organisations involved to say that, um, you know, did you know that this was happening and uh, you should really do something about it. And, you know, until there is, um, I think until somebody complains to the authorities or, or makes it uh, aware, then really something should be done more about it. But it's an endemic thing i mean uh, you know they're all they're all doing it there's um uh one organization i won't name names but you can find out um they're like a mobile uh x-ray service go around sort of nursing homes and um they they have this system which which you can see online where they identify the images and the patient id is actually their social security number so (laughs) it's not only their their sort of medical history that is um uh, available to everybody, but um, it goes further into uh, publishing social security number details as well. So um, yeah, something something should be done, but it's uh, pretty jaw dropping that um, it's still going on. Well, at least the elderly are never really targets of scams. Yeah, so, yeah, that should be fine. <laughs> People said, have too much respect for the yeah. elderly. Well, it said yeah. there's 19 children's hospitals as well that oh, uh, that fall under this. Come so. on, man. 
This you know, th yeah. this goes back to the argument where people talk about not wanting to use fingerprints for authentication because if your password gets stolen, you can just pick a new one. But if your fingerprints get stolen, you can't. So, you know, your mm. medical records, that's something you can't change that once it's out, it's out. And there are yeah. some sensitive medical conditions people don't want people to know about. You, you'd mm. think with HIPAA compliance and all that the medical industry would be kind of ahead of the game in protecting this, but it... And mm -hmm. apparently it's quite bad. Safe harbor for bad practice. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So uh, I know you guys are doing a webinar about this. It's actually taking place tomorrow, but that's before we uh, post this episode. So it's taking place in yeah. the past, um, but it's about uh, cybersecurity and healthcare system exposed. So are you guys just kind of diving deeper into this or are you um, looking at, at solutions that they need to take? Uh, all of that, really, because... Um, you know, I think it's a good uh, case. We, we do um, a lot, um, you know, we talked about cloud earlier, but we do a lot in the industrial control systems market too. And that's kind of similar to the, uh, the medical market in that you're talking about um, IT that's provided uh, very much as a tool just to fulfill, um, uh, you know, a purpose within there. And security really is uh, secondary. I guess, um, you know, we're sort of, mainstream IT guys, so security is um, is something we appreciate and think about a lot more. But if you're a, a you know, clinical uh, medical practitioner or somebody running, you know, a factory production line, um, security is um, is a long way, way off. They've got a lot of catching up to do. So we're going to talk about um, what we found as an example of how um, serious um, you know, the, the, the security implications could be. Um, and we're going to talk about solutions uh, to that before, you know, before the unthinkable happens. And you mentioned um, to me before that, that that actually will be archived and, and recorded oh, yeah. so people will still be able to go. So if uh, that kind of leads us to our, our, our next discussion about what uh, what's coming up for you guys. But uh, if you uh, if you're interested in, in checking that out at home or if you're if you work in healthcare IT or if you just don't want that to happen to your information as well, because it—I mean—it's universal yeah. to mm -hmm. everyone. Um, yeah, go ahead and check that out. And so your your website is newnettechnologies.com, and uh, is that you where they, they yeah. go to find that? Okay. Yeah, there'll be links on uh, on there, and uh, you know, it's a fascinating subject. Dirk will—I um, think he's going to show you how he got it. It's not really hacking, like I say. It's uh, using sort of publicly available um, information and a uh, very simple. Uh, two-step process to start reading uh, uh, medical record uh, details, or certainly the metadata uh, relating to those images. Yeah, and if you so, if you want to find out also more about the the change tracker there or the other products, I know you guys just launched a, a cloud tracker as well. Is that right? Yeah, we've got some uh, some big plans for uh, for this year. So cloud tracker is is a big part of that. Um, obviously, the move to cloud is um, is unstoppable, um, and you know, with all the added uh, complexity around cloud uh, configuration settings, um, there's, uh, you know, multiplied potential for um, security problems to come into that. So cloud is something that lends itself very well um, to what NNT do as far as change control and secure configuration uh, monitoring. So, I mean, it's, it's not new for us. We've been monitoring and protecting cloud systems for a long time, but this is a sort of... Uh, uh, a sort of step two for uh, cloud monitoring, getting into the sort of AWS underlying infrastructure, Kubernetes, uh, Azure. Um, the other thing, as I just mentioned, is around the sort of industrial control system market, which um, is, is sort of the other end of the spectrum. You know, you're talking about very kind of very simple devices, but doing really important jobs, you know, things controlling, uh, you know, turbines and temperatures and pumps and chemical flows. And uh, all of those are, um, you know, unbelievably prone to attack and uh, a lot more governance needs to be brought to those systems, which we're looking to uh, automate and simplify. Fantastic. Well, like I said, check out newnettechnologies.com for that info. And, uh, and Mark, thank you so much for, uh, for taking the time to join us today and, and for your platelets. We appreciate those. I don't know if we get to um, use them over more, here. There's, <laughs> there's plenty more. There's plenty more where they came from. So, yeah, keep coming. So, but, uh, no, thanks. Uh, thanks for having me on. It's been All great. Right. Well, thank you so much, Mark. But uh, stay tuned, everybody. We're going to take a quick break. We're going to be back with the news right after this on Technado with Don Pazette. Mm -hmm. 
This is Josh. Josh spent $2,500 on a week of classroom training for CompTIA A+, and got certified. Josh got a good job that pays $40,000 per year. This is Jeremy. Jeremy only spent $299 on a full year of training from IT Pro TV, including A Plus and 300 other courses. Jeremy also got a great job that pays $40,000 per year. Jeremy used the more than $2,200 he saved on IT training for a fabulous tropical vacation. Now, Jeremy is still using his IT Pro TV membership to study for Network Plus and Security Plus to advance his career, but not spending any more money. Since all three are included in his IT Pro TV membership plus 300 more courses. Don't be like Josh. Choose IT Pro TV for your IT training. All right, welcome back to Technado and thank you so much to Mark for taking the time to join us today and uh, it was a very very medical uh, focused segment there but but they do a lot but uh, medicine yeah. rocks. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Science. Yeah. It's the best. But we do have a lot of news to get to. Um, as Don mentioned, uh, there's a lot of articles, and uh, we, had to, we had to pick and choose the, the best of the best. And our first one comes from Pharonics.com. Red Hat, Red Hat announces no-cost uh, RHEL for small production environments. Kudos on the pronunciation of RHEL. Yeah, yeah, good yeah. job. Thank you. I, I, I'm learning. You are. I'm it's I'm like, it's like machine learning where, you know, I, I, I get little bits of information. I don't remember them as often as computers, <laughs> gotcha. but uh, I'm getting better. So a few weeks back, we announced that Red Hat uh, was shifting their financial investment from CentOS to CentOS Stream, which effectively has killed the CentOS distribution. They you know basically are not getting official Red Hat support after... Uh, uh, now, right? I think it's already dead at this point. Eat it, CentOS. <laughs> <laughs> you hear this? It's already dead. So uh, it's been a big topic. Uh, a lot of people have been talking about it. One of the Red Hat board members had come out and, and spoken on it and said, basically, uh, you know, Red Hat is the single largest contributor to CentOS, and that they have chosen to put that money into CentOS Stream, that the the people on the CentOS board do not get to determine what the Red Hat en engineers work on. Uh, so there's been some bad blood created in the community. Uh, so Red Hat is trying to kind of had the blow a little bit. And one of the steps that they announced this week is that they are expanding their Red Hat developer license that's available. So you can get a Red Hat developer license right now for free. And normally you would get one physical install and then basically, uh, well, they would say unlimited virtual machines, but really 99 virtual machines that you could then run with Red Hat all under this free license. So it was a great for, you know, for people learning. But not for production, obviously. So in production, you need to switch. Well, they've expanded that license now to include up to 16 physical systems or virtual machines that can be used in production. So now Red Hat is effectively free for up to 16 machines. And if you go beyond that, that's when you need to pay and enter into a contract. So kind of neat to see them back up a, a little bit. We are still seeing new CentOS-based or Red Hat-based distributions coming out that'll hopefully fill the void of CentOS, but it, it takes away a little bit of the sting, and for people learning Red Hat, it's a great way to jump in and, and get access. Two things on that article. One, I'm shocked that people got tribalistic about something. That's just not our nature it's normally. crazy, especially so in the world super, of Linux. Super weird, yeah, especially in Linux. I yep. mean, just the most even-keeled people you'd ever meet in your life. <laughs> uh, and number two is that they, it's funny that they're kind of like, Hitting the panic button a little bit on like, oh, okay, people didn't like what we just did there. Let's, um, hey, hey don't, don't worry about that. We got you covered. I mean, 16 servers, that's not bad for a small, small yeah. business. Yeah, you know, if you're trying to set up like a dev environment and your production environment's in the cloud, you could do it that way, I suppose. Um, you burn through 16 servers pretty quick, though. Well, it just depends on, obviously, your, yeah. your model. And and it is just RHEL, so it's not things like Satellite and Ansible and all the other different products that they have that are paid products. You know, you wouldn't be getting that. It's just the the Red Hat Enterprise Linux operating system itself. And Fedora is still free, right? I mean, that's not something yeah. you'd put in a production environment. Yeah. So like Fedora is cutting edge, new stuff, not designed for production. You know, maybe suitable for a workstation, but borderline. CentOS Stream is supposed to be the nice middle ground that's good for workstations, and then Red Hat, where you'd, you know, you'd want RHEL on your servers. Are you seeing a big shift toward other distributions of Linux to, like, hey, Red Hat kind of left us holding the bag, let's jump ship over here? 
a lot of people have been jumping to Ubuntu, and ah. that's that's been happening the last couple of years anyway, right? Because if you think about it, like if you're deploying in the cloud and you want to auto scale, yeah, everybody's got Ubuntu. Yeah, I'm gonna have five servers today. I might have 500 servers tomorrow. I can't do a purchase order with Red Hat. <laughs> I gotta just let that scale yeah. up. And with Ubuntu, you don't have to pay them a dime. And then when it comes time for support, you can call and pay then, right? Oh so yeah. So like on demand payments. Yeah. Yeah, it's kind of a hedge good bet. idea. Yep. So it's it's a good time for them. I'm you know I I prefer. Red, Red Hat, Hat over Ubuntu, but I find even myself I'm running Ubuntu more lately. I, I'm I'm surprised to hear that because you've you've long talked about ah eh, Ubuntu is kind of sketchy and but mm -hmm. have they upped their game? No, not really. Where, okay. No, uh, so Red Hat is more stable. Yeah. Right. So so they they're slower to release new software. They typically run older versions of libraries, but they've got engineers behind the scenes that are making sure that is a stable, robust, secure operating system. Ubuntu is a little more forward, right? Yeah. So there are newer versions of libraries. The operating system is bloated. Even their minimal install is, is fairly large compared to some of the others that are out there. Uh, so a lot of the things I've said negative about Ubuntu in the past are still true. But that licensing model makes a huge difference. <laughs> so it's, that pro and con list gets a little a little weird from time to yeah, time. Yeah, yeah, it's kind of bloated. It's got Microsoft Encarta pre-installed. <laughs> hey, don't diss the Encarta, man. Yeah. CompuServe. No, I love it. I love it. Still using it. <laughs> Still, yeah. I remember my first Encarta CD. Yeah, I was like, oh, this is awesome. I mean, it's shoot, dude, the world of information. Yeah, 1995 or. Whatever and now we got it was. Wikipedia. I mean, do you remember books? Oh, yeah. <laughs> so it was funny. It was at a furniture store. And they had the exact copy of the World Book Encyclopedia that I that wow. we had on our shelf. I was like, if I buy furniture, I'm going to make them throw that in <laughs> as a part of the deal. <laughs> like, if I don't get the World Books, then I'm out of here. <laughs> yeah, and they're probably just those paper, like those fake. <laughs> <laughs> no, I checked them. They're they're oh, legit. They're real. Yeah, yeah. Like, I'm going to cut these pages out and put <laughs> weapons in these. That's what you use books for uh, these days. <laughs> All right, well, let's move on uh, to our next article, which is from decrypt.co, how to use the uncensorable web on privacy browser Brave. Privacy-centric Brave has integrated the interplanetary file system, which is IPFS, into its updated browser. So obviously we've talked about Brave before and uh, kind of where it's um, forward-thinking in terms of ad blocking and, and um, tracking and things, but the uncensorable web is... This sounds new. So a few months ago, I passed on an article about the IPFS because I said, this is going nowhere. Wes and, uh, thought it was like an <laughs> Onion article when he saw it in the news feed. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, so I, I passed on it. We didn't report on it. Yeah. Uh, but it looks like Brave has taken it up with official support in the browser. And Daniel, have you had a chance to work with it? Yeah. So I played with it just a little bit. There, they. If you look through the article, it talks about two different ways in which you can work with it. Brave natively supports it. I think Chrome does as well. Uh, which makes sense, you know, Brave is kind of a Chromium-based browser. So um, you basically just drop the URL in your browser, and yay, IPFS works great. I tested it. It worked. It's great. There was a lot less ads. Different little bit of formatting between a normal page versus IPFS pages, but nothing that's, like, jarring or crazy or anything like that. The other way is to, like, create your workstation as an IPFS node, and that way you partake in that that ecosphere and you kind of contribute to it. So if you want it to be more robust, that's what you would want to do. Is this yeah. like dark web light? Sort of. So, <laughs> yeah. so for people who aren't familiar with IPFS, it's the interplanetary file system. And it's basically, think of BitTorrent, right? right? So instead of building a web page and putting it on one server, you basically become like a BitTorrent node for that website. And you distribute that out across a peer file system or peer-to-peer -peer file system. So there are multiple copies of your website stored all across disparate systems. And that's why they call it uncensorable, is even if they remove the source, if they you know hunt you down and take out your server that seeded this thing, you've got new seeds that are out there, all these other systems. And so in theory, once something is in the IPFS world, it can't be removed again. That somebody can maintain a copy of it. And so that's that's where it achieves that. Now, there's pros and cons to this. And I'll tell you, BitTorrent is largely used for illegal file sharing, right? Uh, so no, no beating around the bush yeah, on that one. That's yeah, it's totally legit. But there are legit purposes for it. And so, for example, for me, I, I got tired of all the cloud drives that I have. Because I have OneDrive Personal, OneDrive Business, Dropbox, Google Drive, Google Drive Business, iCloud. And, and so what I started doing is I have one virtual machine that runs all those sync clients. And then on it, I run what used to be called BitTorrent Sync, but now it's called Resilio Sync, which just yeah. sets up a private BitTorrent network. And so on each of my workstations that I use, I just run that little client and it does BitTorrent to, to sync between my own machines. It's private. I control all the information that's in there and I can add and remove machines. So it's kind of a neat system. With IPFS, it's not quite like that. 
you join onto this network and you are sharing your information and other information is being shared with you and you don't necessarily know what that was or is. Right. So there could be illegal, illicit material. You could be providing the backup copy of some really nasty stuff and not know it. That's the trade-off, just like the Tor network or you know the, the Onion Router, uh, that there can be some really nasty stuff on there. And if you're an exit node, you could be allowing that to happen. Yeah, I, I guess like the, the question then becomes, do we either ban or highly regulate a technology because it could be possibly used for illegal purposes or like that. That's kind of the sticky thing when it comes to like net neutrality and all the other stuff. Right. Yeah. Uh, I think that you don't have to look too far to find an example of where this is going to end, which would mm. be like parlor. Mm. Uh, uh, you know, that so they hit this type of network and now they can stay up. If, if companies like Facebook and stuff are being held liable for the content that's on their site. Well, in this case, you know, we, could Brave be held liable for it? Maybe, right? They, they've got the support that's built into yeah. it. Uh, but, but anybody acting as an entry node to the system would be susceptible. Yeah, I was going to say, even as an end user, wouldn't I be liable if... If, you if know, you're sharing. It, yeah, exactly. If something is seeding out of my computer, that even if I didn't... But you would have to have gone to that site, right? Or like to, to have downloaded no. that to be... Not necessarily, no. If no. you're a part of the IPFS like ecosphere, then okay. you're just going to get random bits of information oh, okay. coming and, and going from your machine. Although the way you propose, Peter, Peter, um, would actually make more sense. Like if I went to the page, now I'm right. seeding a copy of it. That would give me some control. Which, which it does do, if I'm not mistaken, where if so, if you visit a website, it does basically kind of cache that information so that if you were offline, you could still browse to that information. So yeah. maybe there is some... So, like that's how it is with uh, Debian. If you go and download yeah. Debian Linux and you use the torrent, yeah. right? So now you are seeding that torrent. You're not seeding everything else on the network. So if it operates that way, that that's not so bad. Plus, I also looked into like I was like, okay, well, how would I create a website that was on the IPFS network? And you have to have basically like you you drove a stake in the ground, and said here is the original content. And now it can start to be distributed, but there's always like a, a source point to it. All right. I still have our moon conspiracy webpage. You guys remember we brought <laughs> yep. that up as a oh, uh, yeah. dark web. As, yeah. yeah. We brought it up in Tor as a, right. uh, uh, a hidden service. Yeah. We should do that on IPFS. Oh, that'd be cool. That way our moon conspiracy theory can live on forever. <laughs> yeah. Forever. A webinar. Here we go. <laughs> a webinar. But I like the idea of you have to abandon it because then you can, can't go before a judge and go, no, you're on right. I don't know why yeah. this uh, illicit material was on my computer. Like yes, you do. <laughs> <laughs> yes, you do. <laughs> All right. Uh, our next article is from tech.slash.dot.org. After 28 years, Two Cows finally closes its downloads site. Mm, so I, I always thought Two Cows was just like a not it's a where, registrar, it's where, but it's where I got all my greatest malware. It's a download <laughs> site. So Two Cows is a registrar. They're actually the second largest registrar behind uh, GoDaddy. Uh, so that is how people know Two Cows today. But if you've been in technology for a long time, Two Cows got a very different start. Way back in the BBS days, the bulletin board systems, when you dial up to other computers, Two Cows started as a collection of shareware. Uh, so you could dial into their BBS and download software. They were one of the first ones to make the jump onto the web. And the Two Cows website for decades was the place you'd go to download if I wanted to get WinZip or you know any of the various utilities and software programs are out there like Weather Two Cows Bug. <laughs> Weatherbug Bonsai Buddy <laughs> Yeah Buddy yeah. What was you, the what was the audio player that everybody used Winamp Winamp, oh, Winamp. Yeah. yeah that's still around though that's still a good yeah. player Yeah you know Winamp a lot of people have nostalgia for it. I always thought they took that llama thing a little bit too far. They, they did. They did. They, they were really proud of that llama. You don't install Winamp. You slap the llama or whatever. You know, yeah. it's like. <laughs> really kicks the llamas and it would like make a llama noise. Yeah, yeah, it's crazy. But Anyone <laughs> under 30 right now is going, what, what are, are they, they talking about? They talking yeah. about? Yeah. But, you know, it, it's just a, a sign. It, Downloads for Winamp. Just it's one of those things that was so <laughs> important. 30 years ago, 25 years yeah. ago, and now it's reached its end. And, and Two Cows, they even said that they've uh, they've kept it online just for nostalgia's sake, but it's so hard to maintain a legacy system like that. The security vulnerabilities come out all the time, and trying to maintain it, it's just not worth it, and so they are finally taking it down. So it's the end of an era. Uh, I did learn something new. I didn't realize that Two Cows was an acronym. Oh, I, yeah. I didn't either. Yeah, that's kind of neat. So it stands for the Ultimate Collection of Winsock... Uh, oh, shoot, I screwed it Software. Up. Software. Okay. Yeah, you're right. Yeah, you got I, it. I thought I might be sure. You nailed it. Um, <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, so that's what it started as way back in the very beginning and evolved into one of the first download sites on the internet. Honestly, the fact that it's still this piece of like internet history that is just now going the way of the Dodo. And I, I read the article as well, and they were uh, you know, talking about how the 
uh, Internet Archive program is basically got all that information so there's no real need for them to continue to yeah. curate that uh, so it's still kind of lingering around just not in the two cows format but it's the end of an era yeah you know? so, boy archive.org they've been doing some crazy stuff you know we, we talked the other week about flash ending so mm -hmm. adobe flash is now dead and i thought like most people well crap how am i going to watch the old strong bad comics <laughs> right <laughs> And uh, you guys remember Homestar yeah. Runner? Oh, yeah. Uh, you can go on archive.org, and they've got an emulator. That, no way. That, oh, yeah, yeah. That's awesome. And it plays it in browser. You install it. It's not running Flash. It, right. it's, oh, uh, that is awesome. Yeah, it's really neat stuff. Is it like running Flash on a virtual machine or something? Or I, I don't know. Maybe huh. like a virtual browser. Yeah. Interesting. Well, what, what I find interesting here is that it says Two Cows uh, was founded back in 1993 on a library computer. In so, Flint, like, Michigan. Yes. Yeah, in Flint, <laughs> Michigan. So, I mean, to access a BBS... Wouldn't that computer need to be on like all the time to be able to be called into? If it was a library computer, then likely it was one of the first ones that was connected. Like, because back back in the '90s, a lot of universities, every computer would have a public IP on the internet. Yeah, and like an actual, yep. directly addressable address. They didn't use NAT and stuff back so, then. So, so someone else could be using the computer for the Dewey Decimal System, and people are still accessing. Yeah, they run an FTP server in the background or whatever. And, yeah. All right. There were a number of sites like that. I, I don't know if you remember the old uh, CD-ROM.com. Um, oh, what was that company? I don't recall that one. Uh, it was named after a city in California, Oak something or another. But uh, uh, CD-ROM.com, they used to get all those shareware CDs. Yeah. And so they would just take all those shareware CDs and put them together on this one and site and you could go and download site. them. Oh. Yeah. Yep. What the latest version of man, Doom. Man, those things sucked. <laughs> <laughs> Like wallpaper I, I, your house with oh AOL man. CDs. The first time I was like, yeah, this is odd. Look up, it's like 50 games on this CD. They are all horrible. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> There's not a redeeming game in this thing. Now, full of viruses. Yeah. Yahoo toolbars. <laughs> all right. Our next article is from ArsTechnica.com. DDoSers are abusing Microsoft RTP to make attacks more powerful. DDoS amplification attacks are or have abused all kinds of legit services. Now it's Windows. So how can what is a DDoS amplification first? All right. So uh, in the old days, when you would do a denial of service attack, one of the ways to do it was a volumetric attack. You would just overload somebody with traffic. So if somebody was on a 64K ISDN line, all you had to do was send them 64K of traffic per second, and that would fill the line up and they were out of business, right? But in today's modern world of fiber interchanges and 40 gig networks and all that, it's really hard to generate that volume of traffic to overwhelm somebody. So what attackers have to do is get creative and find ways where they can send a small amount of traffic and somehow turn it into a big amount of traffic. And there is a vulnerability in the remote desktop protocol, RDP, where attackers can send it data and they don't, they don't have to log in. They don't have to gain access to the screen or anything. They just send BS data at it. And for every one byte they send, it generates 85.9 bytes in return. So it's like an 85 to 1 ratio on the data. And if they spoof their source address, so if they spoof the source address to be your address, Peter, then they're going to send one byte of traffic to this server, and that server is then going to send 85 bytes of traffic to you. And if they do that on enough machines, now they can overwhelm you and bring you offline. So uh, attacks like this are, are hard to pull off because usually people detect the traffic and stop it. But in this case, people are not patching at a very rapid rate. And so they've seen attacks ranging from 20 gigabits all the way up to 750 gigabits per second of traffic being generated with RDP reflection. Wow. That's a lot of traffic, Don. You know, it's the uh, the denial of service doesn't really get enough enough um, airtime nowadays. You know, we th we think of the sexy data breaches. Oh, man, this company was breached. X company was breached. This much user data was exposed mm -hmm. and so on and so forth. But, man, dropping some site to its knees, depending on the site, yeah. can really cause some havoc out there and cost a lot of money. Yeah, it's really interesting stuff. Remember uh, the hacking group Anonymous? Oh, yeah. And in the early that days. That was their claim to fame. They had that utility, the low-orbit ion cannon. Uh, it was just a little and Windows the high utility. Orbit ion cannon. Oh, it was a high. They had both. Oh, yeah. All right. Because one started like it wasn't as good, so they were like, "We're gonna make this robust." It was hip and enough. Came out with the next iteration. But it was a little program you could load on your computer and join the anonymous network. And then when they would pick a target, everybody running the software would just hit that target at once, and, and then you would get a call from the FBI. Yeah, <laughs> which and, did happen, by the way. 
And the theory was if enough people did it, they couldn't get us all, whatever. Yeah, they just went after who they could get, yep. and they did. So uh, so that kind of stuff, that worked back then, but now people have so much bandwidth. Systems can auto-scale, like if you're in the cloud, and so it's really hard to bring somebody to their knees, but if you can do a magnific or amplification attack, uh, you, you can pull it off. You could. You, it's hard to bring them to their knees, but it's easy to cost them a lot more money, right? That's true, yeah. Yep. yeah if they auto-scale out, yeah, it's going to cost least, them money. It's going to cost them money, yeah. So that's why it's important to notice that that <laughs> that kind of thing has happened so not just when you get the bill at the end of the oh, month see, this would if mark was still on this would be a great chance right. to plug like the change tracker probably, would notice there was a way like, yeah hey you are spending some money <laughs> <laughs> i've noticed that you've decided that you need 600 servers yeah. running same mm. number of checkouts same number <laughs> of legitimate sessions huh. yeah that's an anomaly tracking yeah makes sense i mean even the um a lot of the cloud providers will give you like financial tracking, right? To say, hey, I've set a cap on how much money I'm going to spend with you because this is what we've decided it's probably going to be around. So if you start to go past that, don't do it. Yeah, and yep. you're going to hit that this afternoon. Yeah. So something's going on. But then you then you go down. You, your site goes yeah, down. That, so. That, so, yeah, so you, you got to play can. the pros and cons, right? <laughs> it's pros and cons. <laughs> yeah. All right. Our next article is from ZDNet.com. SonicWall says it was hacked using zero days in its own products. The networking device vendor has published a series of mitigations as it's investigating the incident and preparing patches. So this reminds me of all the old horror movies. The call is coming from inside the house. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and that's basically what happened here, right? Yeah. You know, we we report on vulnerabilities and breaches in companies every single week. Uh, just that's the world we're in now. And uh, in this case, you've got SonicWall, right, that makes firewall products. And obviously, they're going to eat their own dog food. They're going to run their own firewalls. And so when somebody discovered a zero-day exploit that allowed them access into and through the firewall's VPN system, they then applied it to SonicWall itself and actually managed to gain access to their private network. SonicWall is still investigating what they were able to do. But, you know, worst-case scenario, if somebody can get into SonicWall and modify the firmware updates then it would be a repeat of the SolarWinds attack, right? People blindly download software updates from their hardware vendors and apply them, and so you could have a compromised firewall right out of the box. Even if that doesn't happen, this zero day has not been patched. Uh, SonicWall, as of the filming of this episode, has not released a patch for it yet. So that means if you run a SonicWall firewall, you need to be paying attention for anomal uh, anomalous uh, traffic. That shouldn't be so hard to say. Speaking uh, of anomalous traffic, I think I just saw Ronnie run by into the server room and he's flailing wildly, <laughs> just pulling cables. Huh? He's like, he's What's crazy. Going on? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, we don't we don't use SonicWall here, but um, didn't Dell buy them? Wait. I thought they did. Yeah, Dell, yeah, Dell back owns in the SonicWall day, yeah. Yeah, for a while now. Right? So, you know, they certainly have resources available, but I'm curious to see, obviously, SonicWall, that business unit is going to use their firewalls. Does Dell? Mm -hmm. Does EMC? Does Because that's a pretty big organization, so this breach could be larger than we think. Um, they specifically called out their NetExtender VPN in the beginning. Uh, they have now expanded that out to pretty much include all of their VPN-based products. Well, that's got to make you feel good. Right, you know, over there looking at all that rack of Sonic Wall equipment, going, man, I am insecure now. <laughs> Zero day sucks. At least you, <laughs> at least you know about it. At least you know about, it. man. <laughs> I know I am getting breached right this moment. <laughs> Nothing I can do about it. Well, Unless I want to go to like another firewall vendor. <laughs> I mean, that's the thing you talk about the Solar Winds one. I mean, how many other instances are there like this that we don't know about right now? Yeah, where, um, a lot. Yeah. I mean, is this kind of the new, you know, we were talking about DDoS attacks before as kind of the old uh, attack vector. Is this kind of the new way to... This uh, ain't new, man. People? This is... No, yeah, and it's 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 state-sponsored in a lot of cases. Yeah. So, yeah. you know, I, I, you guys ever heard of the book The Three-Body Problem? Mm -mm. No. It's a, a sci-fi novel. It came from a, an author in, in China. The, so the apparently Human Centipede? It's a, a, no, not Human Centipede. Okay, that's three bodies um, too. But in China, there's a big sci-fi movement. This was a, 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 an award-winning book that came out. And uh, it's interesting because the, it's about these physicists, and, and they're talking about uh, how they're at war. But when they bring the scientists in, the scientists are like, what, what war? What are you talking about? Like they, they don't even know they're at war. Yeah. And that's kind of where we're at in the IT world is we're at war and we don't even know it. Yeah. Like you just the other side knows it. They're yeah. attacking yeah. like crazy and we're just sucking it up. The government knows it. Well, yeah. and even if we know that we're at war, we're not sure who it's with. You know, in a lot of cases, yeah. you can, you know, we can trace it's certain with things and everybody. go. everybody. Yeah. That's, that's <laughs> the go, problem. Oh, that, that one's Russia. That one's like, probably China. It's but. so funny. You start talking about space state-sponsored hacking. You're like, okay, well, we know who our allies are. We know who our, you know, our normal enemies are. You put those on the table and say, ah, oh, cool. But then you got to get into the, 
the weird minutia of, well, we're actually still kind of like hacking our allies as well, and our allies are hacking us. Yeah, and- yeah I was reading something about like a World War II thing where the, um, the UK uh, intercepted some message uh, like across our transatlantic, you know, cable yeah. of, of like, oh, there's going to be attack, and they like warned us. We're like. Well, how, how'd you know that, though? Because that's our, our cable, you know. Whoops. I'm sorry. There's something wrong with the line. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I think I think we just need to pick somebody and say, like, that's it. We are sick and tired of Luxembourg yeah. and their endless attacks. <laughs> and, and then you know, we can come up with some defensive strategy and just apply it to everybody. Yeah, just go crazy. <laughs> that works. <laughs> all right, you're on notice, Luxembourg. That's right. <laughs> yeah. uh, all right, well, if you, if you want to get involved in that and get involved in a cybersecurity career, there's a great webinar that's coming up. Uh, it's actually today, uh, Thursday, January 28th. It's Chart Your Path to a Cybersecurity Career. Here from Black Hills Information Security on what they look for in pen testers. And Don will be talking with Jason Blanchard about that Thursday, January 28th at 2 p.m. Eastern Time. But don't worry if you're listening to this after that time. It will be recorded and archived and be up at itpro.tv slash webinars um, shortly after, probably on the 29th. So um, you can take a look at that there. So Chart Your Path to a Cybersecurity cyber Security career at itpro.tv slash webinars. And while you're on that internet, head over to go.itpro.tv slash technado. Uh, there you can find a coupon code for 30% off your uh, the lifetime of your personal plan. You can also uh, find out about a team trial and all the great things available uh, for businesses at ITPro TV. So uh, we're actually uh, in the process of working on the new Technado website. So um, we'll be, be able to plug Ooh. that very soon here. Um, which will be at, at techne.do. And it's going to have Flash animations. <laughs> All Flash, yeah. Strong Bad. Strong Bad will welcome you yeah. in. Yeah. Uh, you don't have Shockwave installed. <laughs> Homestar <laughs> Runner, yeah. Man, that's good. I wonder, if, so, like, is that site even still up? Like, Homestar Can Runner? I, I, mean, I kind of imagine. They're, they're merchandising. Um, actually, my, my wife got me Trogdor the board game for <laughs> Christmas. You? Really? Uh, so, you know, that was recent. That's cool. <laughs> uh, yeah, still up. So that, what are they using HTML5 now? Weird. Yeah, huh. my uh, weird. All right, well, <laughs> it's just not the same. It's not the same. <laughs> the nostalgia. Well, That's thank right. you so much to Mark uh, from NNT uh, New Net Technologies uh, for taking the time to join us today and talk about all their cool stuff and um, how America is still just leaking medical data and America. Yeah. Yeah. We're first. We're first in leaked medical data. That's right. If you're not first, you're last. Yeah. <laughs> what are you talking about? There's going to be second, third. That's stupid. Ain't nothing wrong with silver. <laughs> Man, I was on. What did he say? In that? I was on meth. That whole I, was, I was on PCP I was on when PCP I said that. that. <laughs> oh, that's great. Good times. See, that, yeah. That's a movie reference I get this yeah. time. All right. Well, thank you so much uh, to Mark. And thank you, uh, all of you guys, for joining us. And we'll see you next week right here on Technado with Don Pizzette. 